Hello again and welcome to Herd Immunity News. Today I have an amazing guest. I've got Mr. Noel Wilcox. Now, Noel hit the press a couple of weeks ago here in the United Kingdom, but it's, it's a story that's gone all round the world. This is really a bit of a David and Goliath story where one man who owns a scaffolding company has taken on Transport for London, that's TFL. London Mayor Sadiq Khan basically has nightmares about this guy. Uh, he wakes up screaming and shouting. But without further ado, let me just say, no, how are you, sir? I'm very well. How are you? I'm very well. And look, it's it's fantastic that you came on the show because you've really shown people what can be done with a bit of stoicism, a bit of bravery and resilience. But without further ado, could you just let our viewers know a bit about yourself and what this whole battle with TFL has uh, has sort of included. But obviously there are things that we, we can't or won't talk about because there are situations ongoing. But just tell us a bit about yourself and also tell us what the journey has been like for you. So basically, um, I opened up a scaffold company about seven years ago, you know, put, put my heart and soul into it. You know, like any business, I'm, you know, I'm not I'm not bigging up scaffolding companies over anything else. But there is astronomical overheads, um, you know, when you set up a business. So the business had been going about three years um, and I was in a yard in Harefield. So uh, for your viewers, that's kind of quite near to RAF Norfolk. It's around that sort of neck of the woods. So. It was just after the pandemic. So it was about May, it was end of May, early June, when the clerk in the office, one of the girls in the office, admin girl, called me up and said, we've got £11,500 worth of fines. I was like, right, okay. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. you know, I was I was trying to process... 11 and a half thousand. And then I'm thinking, you know, is it, um, you know, some sort of assessment has come through mm. from HMRC mm. and I'm like, you know, I'm religious with that sort of stuff, you know, a million and one thoughts are just going around my head, you know, at that time. So I said, you know, who's it from? And she said, transport for London. I said, transport for London. We've not even been into London. <laughs> you know, what, you know, the, what on earth is that about? So, she sent all the documents, she emailed, scanned the whole lot, sent it all over to me. And then I was looking at these penalty charge notices. Um, so there were seven of them and they were £1,500 each. So £1,500. Mm. Process that for a minute. £1,500 for one penalty charge. I mean, that is a phenomenal amount of money. It is. So... I obviously went to the yard, spoke to the lads in the yard, and I said, you know, to the driver of the vehicle, you know, who wants to remain anonymous, mm -hmm. incidentally. And I said to him, you know, have you, have you been like driving for a charging zone? He said, not that I'm aware of. So I said, on the route when you're going into Hayes, when you're going into North Holt around that area, was there any charging signs or anything like that? And he said, mm -hmm. I swear to God, no. I didn't see one. So what I did is I went out and I wreckied the route. So I had a look at the signs, you know, around the roundabouts. And then it became very clear to me that I couldn't see any visible signs that stated that there was any sort of charge. So on that basis, I made representations to Transport for London at that stage. And... Long and behold, Transport for London came back to me and they said that they're not going to uphold my representations because they said the onus is on the driver mm -hmm. um, to check their routes to see if there's any charging schemes that, you know, you may enter when, you know, you're driving your vehicle. So I became very suspicious at that answer. Mm. So... I went on the DVLA website. I went on driver's responsibilities. Um, I checked the legal side of that and I couldn't find anything that was written in law that stated that the onus is on the driver to make sure that um, they check any charging schemes that you may be going ahead. Um, sorry, um, going into. Yes. 
So it's unlike when you put a postcode into Google or your sat nav or whatever it might be, you know, when you're, if you're going over the Dartford charge or you're going into the get congestion charge, it will tell you that there's toll roads. And then it might ask you if you want to go another route. Right. But this was not coming up on Google, which made me even more suspicious because mm. I checked those routes. So I was seeing where the jobs were and then, you know, the distance from the postcode where the yard was to these different locations, and there was nothing on the SatNav or Google that illustrated to me that there was a toll or a charge en route. So that made me suspicious. So it was on that basis, basically, that I appealed to the tribunals. But at that point, I, I, I hadn't gone into the depth of the law as to what I actually went into. So I started reading up on the law, um, road traffic regulations, general yes. directions, uh, Ministry of Transport, and it became very, very apparent to me that the signage was incorrect. And it was on that basis that I appealed to the tribunals. So... Can I just ask, sorry to interrupt, just ask yeah. a quick question. What vehicle or vehicles were involved in this? Were they, so were they petrol, was, diesel, year... So it was a it was a diesel Euro five ad blue, okay. Yeah, so it was a diesel. Um, it was a Euro five diesel ad blue. It was a seven and a half ton lorry, right? That had gone into this low emission zone. So once I was aware of the charges, we obviously signed up to the auto pay system because we just didn't want continuous fines coming through because it's it's very stressful, you know. Oh, on top of oh, all the absolutely. other stresses on top of all the other overheads that you've got, yeah. you know, dealing with builders, architects, surveyors, you know, the world of scaffolding. In increases in income tax. Yeah, in increases in corporation tax. Yep. Um, you know, we had to get our heads around the fact now that you um, have a reverse charge of VAT. Mm. So, you know, there, there, there was a lot of legislation and regulation, very high regulation that was being imposed on businesses mm. kind of, over, over the pandemic, which yeah. just didn't make any sense to me. So, obviously, I appealed to the tribunal. Um, sorry, I'd set up the auto pacer. Every mm. time the truck went into the low emission zone, £100 was taken um, from the auto pay system. So, it was like the congestion charge on an auto pay, but every time the lorry went in, it was £100. So, I believe it's £100 for seven and a half tonne lorries, um, 200 pounds for class two and up to 300 pounds for Arctic vehicles right. that were going into, you know, the low emission zone, yeah. which is yet again, a phenomenal amount of money. You know, crazy. If you have to go into London yeah. or around that area, you could be expected to pay up to 700 pounds a week. Yeah. That's on oh. top of diesel costs. It kills your business straight away. It does. It absolutely, you know, it does kill your business. And I, and I noticed as well that very quickly with the auto pay that mm. it started eating into our profits, profits very, very quickly. Um, that year was actually one of the worst years of turnover. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I was actually in a negative, uh, negative mm. profit for that year. Um, so the auto pay system had clocked up just over three thousand pounds in a very very short space of time because literally every time the vehicle went out of the yard yeah. 100 pounds 100 pounds 100 pounds yeah that that was that was in a nutshell that was basically you know the story of the auto pay system so obviously when it went to the tribunal tfl didn't turn up which sort of said to me that it didn't you know that they weren't taking it seriously did so you have a lawyer? Did something... you have a lawyer at this stage? Sorry to interrupt. No, did you have a I lawyer? No, no, no legal did representation. It, did it on your own? Did it on your own? Yeah, I did it on my own. I oh. was confident. I was right. very, very confident at that stage that I was armed with the law. Mm -hmm. um, and everything that TFL had submitted in their defence, uh, for the great word, it was just a load of waffle. Yeah. Yeah, it was about 50 pages of just complete waffle. Absolutely. So they were brazenly trying to relieve you of 11 and a half grand with not a legal leg to stand on. Pretty much. And that, and that became really apparent to me. So it was at that point, once I was armed with that knowledge that I yeah. absolutely refused to be bullied by TFL, sure. you know, the point blank refusal. 
So um, it was done via uh, video call. Mm. It was uh, because of the pandemic. So currently at that stage, none of the courts were seeing anybody. So yeah. it was the hearing was done by um, uh, similar to what we've done, but via yeah. a link. Sure. And obviously, you know, TFL didn't attend. The judge went through my evidence with me. Mm -hmm. He just got clarity from me. And he said, I'm going to allow TFL 21 days to sum submit their evidence mm. that they are lawful, sure. that the road, yeah, that their signage is lawful and authorized. Yes. So it's, let's be very clear. It was 21 days that they were right. given. Wow. So the hearing was in September. Mm -hmm. And he allowed them three weeks. They did not submit any evidence. So that was on the 13th of October. Then the 17th of October, the judge found in my favour. Yeah, and he found in your favour to say that the signs were, were not lawful. Was that correct? That's absolutely correct. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He said, um, when he summed up, he said that he can't be satisfied that the signage is lawful yes, and authorised. But that was on the low emission zone. So that's where the ULES has been expanded to now. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you've, you um, you're on the record, you've been interviewed um, and you've pointed out that hangar lane, that's the boundary for these vehicles coming in. A lot of these vehicles that are coming in from well outside the ULES won't have a clue about these charges because they're not clear. They don't have any any um, specific reference to fines. Absolutely. Um, you know, and I highlighted that when I was down at Hangar Lane, um, you know, and, and, and I gave a clear indication mm. of what the, sh the sign should say and what currently is being posted by um, t Transport for London. Yeah. I mean, well, well done you for having the the stoicism, the bravery, the commitment, the resilience to not give in because I think your story really highlights what can be done. It's not going to be, you can't do these things every single time because as you say, this is just your individual case. Let's make this clear. Um, but people maybe can learn from this, Noel, that get informed and if you believe you're right, stick to your guns. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, I never in a million years, you know, thought mm. for a minute that, you know, I was going to be some sort of inspiration to others. You know, this was just a story that I felt that the public had to be aware of. Yes. And then the public would make up their own minds. Yeah. You know, once all the facts had mm. been produced to the press, yes. you know, the great British public, mm -hmm. you know, would make up their own minds as to, you know, how, how they see like like what you said when when you first you know introduced me yeah. it is this david and goliath you know it is big state yeah. versus the little person with this high regulation unbelievably so i agree with you and it shows the arrogance and the contempt that tfl and sadiq can have for the public that they couldn't even be bothered to turn up they would have known that this would cause you stress. They would have known that this could potentially close the doors to your business and all that comes with that about your family. And they didn't even have the respect to show up in court. Yeah, I mean, look, you've raised a very interesting point there because from my perspective, we've just come out of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. You've just been hit with all of these fines. You know, morale was very, very low of the British public, you know, yeah. businesses had been absolutely decimated, you yeah. know, by the restrictions that had been placed. Yeah. Um, so everybody was struggling. So to receive 11 and a half thousand pounds and for them not even to bother to turn up or send a representative yeah. and just send 50 pages of absolute waffle. Mm. I mean, I read the first couple of pages and then I skimmed over the rest of it and I was like, I'm not even gonna waste my time. Yeah. Because I could just see it was a load of waffle and I just was like, no, I'm, I'm just not even going to waste my time. You know, I spent hours upon hours upon hours of sitting down, researching and studying to make sure that I, I was really acquainted with the law. So, I mean, 
<laughs> the judge, in my opinion, did a fantastic job and he absolutely came to the right conclusion. Yes. You know, and I think he allowed the three weeks for them to provide that evidence because yeah. I think he also knew mm -hmm. that it was going to be a huge decision that he was going to make. Mm -hmm. Because at that time, I, I, as far as I'm aware, that I was the only person that had challenged it on that mm -hmm. basis. Indeed. And this, as I said before, this serves as an amazing blueprint for people to examine and have a look at so that they are prepared for a similar situation because there are tens of thousands of drivers going to go through the same situation as you. TFL are expecting to make up to four, 400 million pounds from what um, the London, the great London mayor candidate Howard Cox has said is a scam. He's called TFL as a scam. He says it's purely a cash grab. And I think the majority of the, of the British public will agree with him. But I've proved that in court. Yeah, you've proved it. I've, I've proved it in court because, <laughs> you know, my case highlights that, that the signage is not legal. Yeah. You know, That's it's right. not. And that, and that has been proven in the tribunal. They were given every single opportunity. Mm. But there's a big flip side to the, to the coin to this story as well. A huge flip side to this coin. Because after the order had been served and TfL were made well, well aware of it. Mm. Firstly, they never challenged the order. They never went for a judicial review. They never challenged it. They never did anything. So they'd accepted that order from the tribunals. Mm. So March of 2022, right. all of a sudden we had bailiffs pursuing us for the other six penalty charges, really? even though all seven yeah. penalty mm. charges, you've got all the information in front of you. I do. Yep. Yeah. All seven penalty charges were heard in that one hearing. So tactically, they'd cancelled one penalty charge notice. Yes. They can categorically see that the signage is unlawful. Mm -hmm. They can see the directions from the tribunal mm. completely ignored mm. the court's ruling. I mean, that's very bold. Can you imagine if you or I yeah. ignored a court order or a court ruling? What What do you think would happen to us? Well, exactly. We'd feel the full force of the other side of the law. But I mean, this absolutely this this, this looks like they're, they're sort of uh, extorting with menaces because there's a an unlawful decision has been made by a tribunal of this land, which is part of the crown. And their bully boys from from TFL or a private company, as they normally are, no, they've just been sent round to harass you, uh, completely disregarding the ruling from the tribunal. Absolutely. Even the bailiff companies, which I think that needs to be called into question as well. Yeah. The bailiff companies that have been enforcing these debts, mm -hmm. they are legally bound to carry out due diligence. Sure. Right. And they even ignored. So we sent copies of the court order to them and say, well, mm. we won this in court. And it very clearly mm. states that all seven penalty charge notices were heard under one hearing. And the judge also said all penalty charges. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't That's say right. the one. Yeah. He said all penalty charge notices. And he also said that I was to be given an immediate refund as well of all of my fees. So for two and a half years, I've been chasing that money. Two and a half so years, it's still going on. So on two bases, Transport yeah. for London mm -hmm. and the Mayor of London have ignored, completely ignored, total disregard yeah. for a court order. It's unbelievable, really, and it's pretty disgusting and disgraceful. How many times did the bailiffs come round and what were your interactions like, like with them? Now, obviously... We've got to be well, careful you get about bombarded, what we say. Don't you? you? You get bombarded. True. So obviously they go to some sort of credit reference agency. They yeah. get all of your details, your email, mm. your telephone number. They get all your contact and then they, and then the whole process starts of them continuously bombarding you. You must contact us, right. you know, letters coming through the door, red, you know, the girl in the office was getting really stressed out with it. Yeah. I'm having to take her off, her, off of her own duties sure. to, um, to deal with this as well, mm. you know, constantly emailing, going backwards and forwards. You know, there's a long chain of emails. Yeah. So even bailiff companies 
are mm. acting completely rogue. So the the money they are they are I agree with that hundred percent and they're chancers as we say in Scotland we call them chancers you down in south they'll probably call them uh, wrongins uh, I think is a is a good term for them because they they're they're completely ignoring a ruling which is in law the final word and what gets me is you mentioned that you signed up to this automatic pay system right. So you think that your problems are going to go away. Now, I've been listening to a lot of uh, friends that live down in Bromley and Kent. And this is the biggest mistake I think a lot of people are making, though, with all due respect, that they're signing up to something that's completely flawed from top to bottom. So vehicles that are even compliant, those are being fined mm. because it's a glitch in the system. They do not recognize that there are cars that, uh, that, that are in a glitch certain years, certain plates. Now, what's happening now is these people are chasing this money. Some of them have been chasing it for a year. They ain't going to get that money back. So if you sign up to the automatic pay, from my point of view, you're really just making a rod for your own back. Well, it is. And I mean, you know, <laughs> the thing is, and, and, and I think what this case exemplifies is that it's one rule for one mm. and another rule for another. <laughs> True. And I don't think that that could be, I don't think that that could be challenged. You know, two and a half years later, and I'm still chasing my money through using the process as well. Yeah. And I've always been taught, if you use the process, you can't go wrong. No. They can get their money within six weeks, but two and a half years later, they've refused a court order. I mean, if a court gives you, tells you what to do, you've got to respect that court order. Right. Or else we've got a fundamental breakdown of society, haven't we? Well, that's what's happening, no. I'm sorry, but you're not playing with a straight bat here. You're playing with a stacked deck. So the social contract is starting to break and fall apart at the seams. That That's what my observations are. If you're taking money off people illegally, whether you're transport for London or uh, Big Barry down the roads, going around all the pubs, want to put his doorman on, you're still extorting with menaces. In my book, I'm saying that. Um, yeah, I mean, look, you know, I, I agree. And, and particularly when something has been challenged using the ju judicial process yeah. and, you know, fully legally, you know, you have to accept the findings of that court. And if you've not bothered to provide your evidence, then I'm sorry, sure. that's on you. That's yeah, exactly. absolutely nothing to me. I'm entitled to that money. Yeah. And it's a phenomenal amount of money and it would yes. make a huge difference to the business. And you don't have that money back. No, they've refused. Just everything's been ignored. All they do is ignore you. So can you imagine if we ignored them? They don't care right. if they don't care if you ignore them because they're just going to send the bailiffs round. You know, it's a it's a very easy it's a very easy system for them because yeah. because you drive a car, they know that you have an asset. Hmm. Now, most of the newer cars most people have on finance or they have at least hmm. the older cars that are or older vehicles that are having to face these charges are slightly older. So I would imagine that most people actually own those vehicles because they've paid off their That's finance right. on that vehicle or whatever. Mm. So it's very easy for the bailiffs to come and lift that vehicle if you don't pay that fine. And yeah. then they'll sell it at auction. You're not going to – I mean, so let's say, for instance, your fine is £1,000. It's, it's gone up to £1,000 yes. because all of those bailiff fees go on top. Mm. And – they come round, the bailiffs come round, they'll clamp your vehicle, they'll remove your vehicle. Let's say that vehicle's worth, I don't know, five, six grand. Yeah. You're never going to see the bit, the bit that's mm. left. Mm. Where do you think that's going to go? That's oh, going to go right. into someone's pocket, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And you need to own your vehicle before you start going down this road. And as I've interviewed um, a gentleman called Giovanni De Stefano, he's, he's also known as the devil's advocate. He, he's put it to the British population, those that have been fined, that they need to look at the, the 1689 Bill of Rights Act because in law, you cannot be forced to pay the fine unless it's gone through court. You must have gone through court and been convicted to pay the fine. Now, we just recommend that people 
look at the legal advice that's out there. We don't recommend any legal advice whatsoever as a disclaimer. But in your case, what it exemplifies, no, is that you need to understand the law mm. and have so the like balls, balls to see it through and the, and the bravery and the tenacity and the stoicism and all those things. But we just, that, that's fantastic. And we'll put all the links down to your, your, um, your communications on that. No, so, sorry, Marcus, just, just one other thing that I would say there, with exactly what you've just spoken about with the Bill of Rights, I think the establishment or the state would probably argue that they do because what they do is they obtain a writ of control from Northampton County Court. Mm -hmm. Now, my understanding of this Northampton County Court is just an administrative process yeah. that they go through. Mm -hmm. So you're not invited to go there and give your evidence. So local authorities, Transport for London, any charging authority, they send all of their stuff to Northampton County Court, yeah. goes through their scanners, goes through their system, and out the other end comes a writ of control. Yes. And that's what gives the bailiff's powers mm -hmm. to come to your property. But yet again, like what you're saying, is that a violation of your human rights? Yeah, <laughs> it is. The right to a fair trial. You're not, you're not sent any paperwork from Northampton mm -hmm. County Court mm. to invite you or, or to tell you that, um, that there's some sort of hearing in process. Mm. They just purely just, it's, it's just like a sausage factory. Uh, of course it is. And, and in some cases, you will need to fund it. You'll need to have quite deep pockets if you want to take this all the way to the, the courts of justice in England. But it, it, eventually someone is going to do that. And if they do know, They'll set one hell of a precedent. They actually beat this because that makes this whole TFL project completely defunct. Did you contact any MP during this uh, this whole thing? Um, I did. I did contact my local MP. Your local MP. What did they say? Uh, not a lot, to be honest with you. The same thing, you know, the same thing that I hear on the doorsteps all the time when I'm speaking to people that they keep going to their MPs and their yeah. MPs keep saying to them, there's nothing I can do. <laughs> I mean, funny enough, if you think about it, a couple of weeks ago when the expansion was starting, mm -hmm. the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom came out publicly mm. and said there's nothing that he can do to stop yeah. the ULES expansion. But why is it that a scaffolder yeah. from Berkhamsted, Berkhamsted. Yeah, has been able to highlight something that's illegal? But the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom can't do anything. That shows you where we're at in this country, unfortunately. Well, and maybe he needs to stack his lawyers. Well, I think his track record is a, an abomination. I mean, we can get on to that maybe briefly a little bit later when we talk about your your um, your support and, and, and membership of the Reform Party, um, which we will touch on before we go. If that's okay with you, no. No problem. But... There is something going on right now in in the TFL zone. And there's a movement that have been born. They're called them the, the Blade Runners. Now, these chaps, let, let's assume that they're all men. There may be some females. Nobody knows their identity. And quite frankly, I don't want to know their identity. Uh, but what they're doing is they're retiring these innocent ULES devices by cutting cables, removing them completely. I've never seen anything like this in my lifetime of uh, of a resistance movement or it's it's sort of civil disobedience, let's call it. No, I don't know what your thoughts on this are, but it just seems to be growing and growing and growing. Well, I think there's three things here, you know, that you have to look at. Um, if you're going to carry out an undemocratic, mm. uh, a completely undemocratic uh, schemes such as the ULES, mm -hmm. you know, the London Mayor, TfL, have received a lot, a lot of resistance on this, mm -hmm. and they're just refusing yeah. to listen. Mm -hmm. So the way I see it, if the state doesn't lit listen to you, people are going to take matters into their own hands. Yes. Now, obviously, both you and I sitting here, you know, we can't you know, condone any criminal behaviour whatsoever because it is a criminal offence. And I'm sure the you know, the police and, you know, are doing everything they can to investigate it. But then the, the flip side to the coin to this as well is how is it 
the transport for London, knowing that the signage is illegal, is still continuing to take money from motorists. Why is that not being condemned by people? So you hear a lot of people coming out condemning uh, the Blade Runners. Mm -hmm. You don't hear anybody on the left Mm -hmm. coming out condemning the actions of TfL. Everybody now knows that the signage is completely illegal and unlawful, but nobody's coming out saying, well, how comes TfL are still taking money from motorists? That's right. I mean, mean, does that not fall into the category of criminal behaviour? It does. It does. And people are having to take matters into their own hands. Um, And the Blade Runners are really the... What drew my attention to them is they were coming from the expansion zone regions like Bromley, like Orpington. Uh, these places have just said, I'm sorry, but we, we've we basically been sucked into this as mm. part of Greater London. And it's caused us nothing but ag, aggravation to our American viewers or Scottish viewers. That's, that's really what it's boiled down to. And they've said, we don't give a damn. I mean, similar cases to yourself, not exactly like that. 75%, what we've read, 75% of these cases that have come before the magistrate's court have been kicked out because they, they've they've uh, they've not had the, the, the spotlight put under them. But they come before the magistrates, and I've spoken to some of these magistrates, and they totally hate this plan. They see it as completely fleecing their area. As you know, there was a court case. They challenged this. I think four or five local uh, council areas took the took TFL to court and they lost in court on, on the ruling. But as 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 uh, even Ian Duncan Smith, the former conservative leader, came out recently, Noel, and he said that uh, he understands where the Blade Runners are coming from. Like you and I, he can't publicly uh, give them a round of applause or salute them um, because that would be stupid, <laughs> quite frankly. But he's come out and said he understands where the civil disobedience is coming from. And so do I. You know, and and I understand it. And understanding something and condoning mm. it are two entirely different things. So let's yes. be clear about that. Yes. So, you know, Ian Duncan Smith, by making those comments, mm-hmm. you know, he hasn't applauded what they're doing, but he understands why. And that's what I'm saying. If you carry out an undemocratic process, expect the resistance. And that is exactly what's happening. You know, and all through history, mm. this is what happens. Mm. You know, go right through history. Yes. That you know, it's just history repeating itself. Yeah. It and is. if you do not carry out the will of the people, then yeah. the people are going to go against you. Right here, right now, the British public, they're broken. Mm. They yeah. are broken from having every single thing, you know, mm. a cost of living crisis, a pandemic, mm. um, everything, you know, um, interest rates rising everything going and and when i was on with um kevin o'sullivan you know i made a point and he actually sat there with his mouth open and he was like you know he literally had his mouth up so Mm -hmm. us the taxpayers are Mm -hmm. paying these huge salaries to civil servants then you've got the certain fat cats because of the privatization of tfl Mm -hmm. that's you know that's gone on sure all earning six figure salaries Mm -hmm. All of these people have forgotten what it's like for the normal person who goes to work every single day, who's just trying to get on with their life, feed their family. Mm -hmm. We're only here once. We're only on the planet once. And nobody wants all of these problems. Yeah. I mean, uh, you're very generous when you say they've forgotten what it's like to to be poor. Some of them have probably never, ever been poor. And I I would go a bit further than that. I'd say they've chosen to forget that they don't Mm -hmm. give a damn. They really didn't give a rat's ass about these families or businesses like yours. That that's that's all all uh, out in the open now because the Imperial College London report that came out that Sadiq Khan's clinging to as his excuse for fleecing drivers and small to medium size uh, business owners is that four thousand people a year were dying due to this. Now this has all been completely debunked. The uh, Richard Tice and Howard Cox have done some amazing work on this. Richard Tice is the leader of the Reform Party. Howard Cox is Reform's London Mayor candidate. Hopefully, maybe he will become the London Mayor. But um, well, we can only pray. We can, well, I, I've got to try and be impartial. Wink. Um, but this whole 4,000 people a year dying is complete bollocks. 
It's alarmism and it has no place in British society because it's, it is the main vehicle, no pun intended, that's being used to take tens of thousands of pounds, well, 400 million pounds are expected to make uh, no, over the next uh, year. Now, that's why yeah. people, they've had enough. They've said, no, I'm not going to do it. That's why you've got the Blade Runner movement. It's expanding and trebling all over. Yeah, I mean, it's nice, isn't it? You know, that you can make 400 million, you know, 700,000 pounds a day. I think under the ULEZ already, that's something mm -hmm. like they've made 310 million pounds under yes. the ULEZ. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but let's not, you know, I don't think anybody's talking about the facts as well of our money. It's yeah. all our money. It's mm -hmm. not their money. Mm -hmm. 150 right. million. I think it was between about 140 to 160 million. Yeah. It's cost to implement this scheme. Can I just That's add? I just add to that that uh, Professor Frank Kelly and Gary Fuller of Imperial College London were given just under a million pounds, 900k, to come up with this report. That's absolutely nonsense, and it's been debunked. So you can see Sadiq Khan and TfL have effectively paid £900,000 to get a ticket that gives them access to fleece drivers in the area of £400 million. That's not a bad return for your investment. Absolutely. Absolutely. But you see, the thing is, yet again, the data is just not <laughs> there. You know, and I'm not a data analyst, but <laughs> I'm far yeah. from it. Neither, um, neither are they. <laughs> but the bottom line is the data is just not there to substantiate their claims. You know, mm. so when you don't, when you can't back up what you're saying, mm. it was like when I went to court, it was all very well me walking in there saying that the signs were illegal, but I had to prove why they were illegal. Of course. It's exactly the same with TFL. They're saying that all of these children... Um, and every time he's yeah. asked a question, the London mayor, every mm. time the London mayor is asked a question, mm. he keeps coming back to this point. So to me, that's that that would be an element of dishonesty, because any question sure. that the London mayor is ever asked, he keeps coming back to 4000 children, 4000 children. Yeah. That That's all, all he says mm -hmm. with regards to any question that he's asked. He could be, you know, it could be a question where somebody says, my God, isn't it hot today? Oh yeah, but yeah. 4,000 children are dying from um, yeah, breathing related, uh, you know, from emissions. And it's like, to me, there is a certain element of dishonesty. Yeah, he doesn't care about London. Sadiq Khan doesn't care about the health of children. All he wants to do is fleece the drivers and extort money from them on a flawed narrative, and they're doing the same throughout the whole of the United Kingdom. This isn't just happening in London. It's Manchester, Liverpool, Bristol, Birmingham, Glasgow, Aberdeen, Edinburgh. It's going to be ULES Britain. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think so. I think the way that thing, things are certainly going at the moment, it's just high regulation. Mm. You know, I, I was in Santorini recently, um in in july i got engaged oh and, congratulations uh, thank congratulations thank you, thank, you, thank you very much and um when i was in santorini there's not even a traffic there's not even a traffic light on the island hmm. there's hundreds upon <laughs> thousands of cars you know yeah. it's a very very busy island yeah but guess what i didn't see one accident wow and there's quad bikes there's motorbikes there's yeah. um there's like those buggies and, yeah. you know, everybody's kind of cutting about everywhere to, to get somewhere on that island. And I just didn't see one accident. I'm sure that they do have accidents. Sure. But it's just this constant regulation. Yeah. And everyone's really getting bored of this regulation. It is. It's a technocracy and it's based on flawed science. And Howard Cox, the uh, as I say, he went down into the London underground with these little... Um, particulate meter that's WHO approved and he found out that the air down there is 10 times more deadly than it is on street level in London, even in the most uh, congested part of, of London with vehicles. So if City Khan really cared about Londoners, he'd be closing the underground down, surely, or fining, uh, fining himself. It's just complete nonsense, isn't it? 
I, yeah, you know, I completely agree. And then obviously those that are opposed to what you and I are saying. Yes. You know, when people are going going down there with meters and then coming mm. upstairs, mm. you know, they want to say, you, you know, their argument is, yeah, but you're not a scientist. Well, I, you don't need to be a scientist, do you, to yeah. read a meter? A meter just tells you what, yeah. you know, what the air quality is. So you're absolutely right. They went down to the underground. Yeah. It was 10 times more than what it was upstairs. You may not be a scientist, but you can read a screen for God's sake. Exactly. <laughs> I'm sorry, but for me, it, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like a football match. You know, just accept yeah. it. Even if yeah. it goes to penalties, you get beaten. Sure. You know, there is no argument, really, you know, for, because everything that they say it's just not substantiated by hmm. evidence. Well, that's why, want. that's maybe why the Blade Runners, you said it's like a football match. Maybe that's why the Blade Runners are taking away the goalposts. Quite, yeah, quite, quite possibly. Um, you know, I mean, like I say, um, you know, they've got their own reasons why they're doing sure. it. They see what they're doing is the correct thing to do. Sure. You know, they do talk about vulnerable people. And yes. ever since this story has broken, I have had vulnerable people who have contacted me. Yes. I've had a pensioner of 86 who said to me, thank you so much for doing what you've done. It made me actually quite emotional. Mm -hmm. And I was in I was in the van with my business partner and he obviously heard the call. And yes. he was like, that's actually really emotional sure. because an 86-year-old um, an ex 86 year old gentleman, yeah. you know, had contacted me and said that he's got to pay twelve pound fifty mm -hmm. out of um, out of his pension. You just know, to get again, out, get his food, see people, yeah. maybe get his medical care. And the thing is, he would be charged if he signed up to this automatic pay system. If you Absolutely. and you'll never get that money back. You are but the point think, in case. But there's also another little catch to the the ULES here because people yeah. seem to think that when you enter the zone, mm -hmm. so let's say, for instance, if you enter it and you're in London for a week because you're staying there, right. that you only pay the once. No, you've got no. to pay every single day because they've got the cameras everywhere in London. So wow. let's say, for instance, if you went into London and you were staying in a hotel, mm. uh, you know, in London and you were there for a week, if you drove your car three times in London that week, you're mm. going to get charged for those yeah. three dates. Of course. So yet again, there's no signage there to tell you that. My point is, if you've signed up to this grab your money scheme, I'm sorry, but you ain't going to get that money back. You think you're doing the right thing. You think you're being a respectable citizen. You think you're um, contributing to the whole tax system, but you're actually being fleeced completely. If you sign up to the scheme, that's what just astonishes me that people, I mean, what happens if you don't sign up to the scheme and you drive into London? Well, what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> I mean, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to go right round, round the roundabout anyway. They're going to find you anyway, but you're going to have to make them work for the money. And a lot of times, as we've seen in Birmingham, may I bring this point to you? No, but 60,000 fines. Birmingham City Council, who are bankrupt up to their neck. We just found out that they're in hock to 360 million. That's not very good, is it? We just found out that they had to kick out as well 60,000 of these fines because people said, sod it, I ain't paying. Which is what's going to happen. Of course, they can't pay. It's not like they won't pay. They can't pay. They don't have the money. Your pensioner that you're talking about, the 86-year-old gentleman, he gets a pittance from the state, doesn't he? But this will bring us on to your Reform Party because we, we know we're watching our time. We've gone well over time, but you're a fascinating guest, so I'll talk to you oh, forever. Thank you. You're a, you're, and, you, and we salute you for your, your tenacity and your stoicism. That's really the word I'm looking for, stoicism. So you are with the Reform Party and you're a spokesperson as well. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that, please. So, look, my view is when things affect you, mm -hmm and you want to do something about it, you need to join a political party. So when I looked at what values I hold, the Reform Party have those same values as me. You know, they're anti-high regulation, mm -hmm. which is exactly what I, you know, which is exactly what I'm about. You know, if you, if you look at reform and you look at the policies, you know, in terms of illegal immigration. We mm. want to take control of our borders. That's not racist. No. You know, that, that's not a racist stomach, uh, sorry, yeah. comment. 
Yeah. You know, that's just not racist. You know, we want to take control of our borders. Mm. We want to increase the tax threshold from £12,500 to £20,000 yeah. to grow our way out of the financial collapse that we're seeing here in the United Kingdom at the moment. Mm. And throughout this process, one of the things that I absolutely love about reform mm. is the support that they've given me. But at no time have they told me what to do. Every decision that I've made, mm. I've made as a grown up. At no stage have I been policed by anybody. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really refreshing that you've got a party out there that's bold, that's going to really talk about the things that affect people, that's ambitious. We're not afraid to think outside of the box. Rather than this just this two-tier political system that we're seeing in the United Kingdom at the moment of the Conservatives and the Labour government, it's just not working. No. Tell me one thing that's working in the UK. I can't. You, I'll, tell, they, I'll, tell you what is, I'll tell you what is working. I can't tell you. I, I can tell you that the people who are making money from mass illegal immigration, they are having a roaring trade. Companies like Circle are doing a fantastic business, bringing in... We need, we need to in do a, another... We need to do another podcast. We will. We, we will do another yeah. podcast. Like I've, I've had Ben. I've been fortunate enough to interview Ben Habib, who's one of your um, strongest voices. Um, he has fans right across the political spectrum. Richard Tice, I haven't interviewed, and um, I've interviewed yourself and Howard Cox, the London mayoral candidate for the Reform Party. I'm not a member of the Reform Party, but certainly know that um, thousands of our subscribers are and they, they've basically replaced the conservatives from what i can see now as the party that cares about all these things low taxation supporting government controlling um, the borders supporting small to medium-sized enterprises and reducing the size of the state because mm. we are heading into some sort of socialist third world flea pit as far as i can see so all power to you and to reform but before we finish up, is there anything you'd like to like to say to our beloved viewers and listeners? No, no. I mean, but I just uh, there's not really anything that I would like to say. But I just hope that you know, by my case and what mm -hmm. I've done, you know, that it does encourage people to go out there and fight, you know, against the injustices, you know, and use the process. And that's what I would say. You know, mm -hmm. that's the reason why I joined Reform because I felt that there were so many things that were wrong. And all you hear from people when you speak to people, well, there's nothing that I can do. There's nothing that I can do. But if we all had that attitude, the state doesn't care. They're just going to continue doing what they're doing. And they're just getting bigger and bigger and bigger because they're crushing and oppressing their people. Well said. Very well said indeed. We'll, we'll have to get you back on the show another time because there's a, a plethora of subjects to talk about, unfortunately, <clears throat> and reform yourself, Ben Habib, Richard Tice, Nigel Farage, uh, these these gentlemen and others like you are are the people that I think the the British public will start to look at for for support in the first instance, and then from them maybe to engage with you, join the party. We we'll leave all the links that you send us, know that you'd like um, us to share about your story, about how other people can take the best elements of that. And uh, look, just big thank you from us at Herd Immunity News for agreeing to come on the show. Thank it's you been, so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. It has been a great interview, um, and we'll send all the links away very, very shortly. Mr. Noel Wilcox, thank you for appearing on Herd Immunity News. Thank you.